The purpose of tonight's Ask With is to explore the connection between racism and civil rights and social justice and education and to ask ourselves, what can we as educators do to build a more just and peaceful future? Our panelists will discuss a wide variety of strategies and approaches for meeting this goal, but let me express some hope that the conversation will touch at least a bit on promoting more diversity and better diversity in our schools. We are a remarkably diverse country. Already our schools are, as they say, majority minority, an oxymoronic phrase that suggests that reality has outpaced our vocabulary. And yet, despite this diversity, our schools are remarkably separated along lines of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. To just give some examples, the average white student attends a school that is nearly three-fourths white. The average Latino student attends a school that is nearly 60% Latino. And the average African-American student attends a school that is nearly half African-American. More than one in three African-American students attend schools that are 90 to 100% students of color. It would be obviously simplistic to say that all that we have seen in Ferguson, Cleveland, Staten Island, North Charleston, and cities across the United States is entirely the result of racial isolation in our schools. That would be to oversimplify. But I don't think it's too great a leap to suggest, as Thurgood Marshall did in a dissenting decision in 1974 when he warned against allowing for the increased segregation across suburban and urban school lines. It would not be too much of a great, too great a leap to suggest that if more of our children learn together, we might all be better able to live together. Just as diversity and friendship and familiarity can strengthen us, distance and division will certainly weaken us. They sow the seeds of misunderstanding and mistrust, fear and hatred, and ultimately violence. I completely agree with the simple observation that Martin Luther King made decades ago. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other and they haven't communicated with each other because they are separate. Some of our graduates will dedicate their entire careers to pushing back against segregation in our schools and promoting racial justice. For others, it will be one of a number of issues they face as teachers, principals, superintendents, and policymakers. But it's my sincere hope that all of our students, wherever they go, in whatever way they can, continue the conversation that they've started here, continued here this year. Because the promise of diversity can't be fulfilled in a year, it's a lifelong commitment. And it is a difficult conversation. Well, I can just tell you one personal story. I think for this conversation to be successful, there's no right or wrong way to have it. But we all need to strive to be empathetic speakers and generous listeners, because the conversation about issues of race, ethnicity, class, can't happen without some element of trust. And I was thinking about this, and I recalled what happened at the wake after my father died. He died suddenly in 1998 of a heart attack. And when I was at the wake, it was a, it was a devastating loss. He was 67. It was far too young. When I was at the wake, people tended to divide into roughly two categories. There were people who completely got it, and they said just the right thing. Sometimes, most of the time, all they said was, I'm sorry. And I realized that a number of them had gone through a similar experience. And then there were others who, despite best intentions, said absolutely the wrong thing. Things that I didn't want to hear. Things that I thought were absurd, if not offensive. Like, he's in a better place. And I thought, he's in a casket. He's not in a better place. And I was talking to a friend of mine about this, and his wife had miscarried. She was carrying twins, and she had miscarried when she was six months. And he said, I recognize the same phenomenon. 
um, some people understood, said the right thing, in part because they had been through something similar or they were empathetic. Um, and others said the most ridiculous things, things that were really offensive at the time. And I said, didn't that completely bother you? He said, well, what I started to do when I heard someone speak and say things that I thought were really off base is what I told myself was they're saying I'm sorry. They're just not quite sure how to say it. So I think it's upon all of us to be empathetic speakers, to put ourselves in someone else's shoes when we have this conversation. But I also think it's incumbent upon us to be generous listeners, to try to discern whether someone's extending a hand of friendship, despite perhaps a clumsy way of expressing that friendship. Now I'll turn it over to um, Paul Revel and to the panelists. I'd like to thank Paul for agreeing to moderate um, tonight's forum. Paul is a Francis Keppel Professor of Practice here at the Ed School, and he previously served for five years as a Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Much of Paul's work here focuses on redesigning the education system for the 21st century, no small task, with the goal of building a new and holistic engine that gives all students the skills and knowledge they need to live and succeed in the 21st century. Ensuring that all really does mean all requires addressing issues of race and justice that will be broached here tonight. And I'm delighted that we have someone with Paul's depth and breadth of experience in those issues to guide the discussion. I'd also like to thank our four panelists, some of whom this is their second trip to Cambridge, <laughs> Tiffany Anderson, Tracy Benson, Nicole Gibson, and Valeria Silva, who will be introduced more formally um, by Paul. Please join me now in thanking them and thank all of you for coming tonight. Thank you very much, Jim, for those remarks and for personalizing them in a way. Uh, the point about empathetic speaking and listening, I, I think, is a critical point. Uh, we had the Red Sox opening day today. Uh, we have the nicest night, arguably, of the year. We promised you it would be better if you came back, and it was better. <laughs> and yet you're all still here, and for that we're very appreciative um, that you turned out, and we take that as an indication of your interest in the, the important topic that we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to make a few remarks just about how we're going to focus up our conversation, uh, we're, and, uh, and then eventually we're going to turn it over to you to ask some questions. But we're here today as a community of educators at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, animated by recent and continuing crises which are indicative of longstanding injustices. Those injustices, including racism, discrimination, violence, bullying, and educational, social, and economic inequity are longstanding and have profound effects on our children and our society. As educators, we are most of us idealists, determined to use our expertise, experience, and insight to help our, our children overcome obstacles, become educated, and ultimately become successful citizens, workers, heads of families, and lifelong learners. At the same time, most of us passionately believe that education can be an instrument for improving our society, for making a fairer, less bi biased, less violent, more tolerant, more inclusive, more egalitarian society. Our topic tonight is how do we accomplish these goals of educating our children for success and improving our society? What are the most effective strategies for dealing with the sensitive and sometimes explosive issues like racism, inequality, violence, social justice, that are so much a part of our children's lives and yet so often overlooked in our schools. What will it take to effectively implement strategies that we talk about this evening and to actually make them happen? So we want to be, in a way, biased toward action here. What can a school of education, what can the educators who are in this room and those who will follow you through institutions like this do to ameliorate this situation. Uh, that's our focus. We have a distinguished panel to help us consider these questions. We're honored that Su Superintendent Tiffany Anderson and parent leader Nicole Gibson, who have directly participated and led during the recent events in Ferguson, Missouri, have made time to join us on this panel. And 
recount their experiences on the turbulent front lines of this work. We have Dr. Valeria Silva. She is the superintendent of the Minneapolis Public Schools, a district that has achieved national recognition for its work on addressing the sensitive issues that we're considering today. And we have our own Tracy Benson, a second year student in HTSE's EDLD program and a former school principal. I wanna take a moment to more fully introduce our panelists. Tiffany Anderson has been superintendent of the Jennings School District in Jennings, Missouri since 2012 and has led the district from being close to unaccredited to becoming a district that exceeded the fully accredited benchmarks. She began her role as superintendent in 2005 in the Montgomery County Public Schools in Virginia. During her tenure, the district moved from having seven schools accredited to having all 23 schools achieve full accreditation. Anderson has been a public school administrator for 18 years in various roles that include being a principal, assistant superintendent, and chief academic officer. Her career has been committed to eliminating the achievement gap that contributes to the cycle of generational poverty. Her publications include Closing the Achievement Gap and Transforming Schools for Excellence. She earned her undergraduate and doctorate degrees from St. Louis University and her master's from the University of Missouri in St. Louis, which is where she is currently an adjunct professor. In 2014, Anderson was recognized for her leadership during the Ferguson unrest and has recently received national recognition as one of Education Week's 16 leaders to learn from. Nicole Gibson is a parent in the Hazelwood School District in Missouri and a social media activist for the hashtag Ferguson movement. She's a member of the Hazelwood Parent Teacher Association, Student Handbook and Behavior Guide Committee, and Key Communicators, a group which meets with the superintendent to keep PTA members informed on st the student achievement gap and other district information. Gibson has been a substitute teacher for five years within both Hazelwood School District and the St. Louis Public Schools. She's co-founder of the Parents for Peace North County, a parent group which secures resources for families affected by Ferguson. Gibson is an independent marketing and communications consultant with more than 20 years of social media, public relations, and marketing communication experience. She has managed media relations for major television network shows. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri at Columbia. And she bought with her a key consultant in her work, her son, Cole, who's sitting in the front <laughs> row. Cole, you want to stand up and take a bow? Yes. <laughs> Valeria Silva has been superintendent of the St. Paul Public Schools in St. Paul, Minneapolis since 2009 and has implemented revolutionary changes in achievement, alignment, and sustainability. Her strong school, strong community strategic plan <clears throat> is gold with eliminating the achievement gap and ensuring that all students achieve at higher levels. Forging key strategic relationships is a high priority for Silva. She has strengthened ties with nonprofit community partners, corporate and business partners, major funders in government. She worked closely with the mayor and the educational leadership team to design and implement an out of school initiative. She's been instrumental in helping 72 organizations make commitments to serve students and families in the National Promise Neighborhood Initiative. St. Paul is only one of 20 cities to receive a planning grant from Promise. Silva has served for over 25 years as an educator and administrator in roles including chief academic officer, principal, assistant principal, director of English language learners, and coordinator of Spanish immersion programs. Her passions for students first drives her relationship and leadership. And last, but by no means least, a member of the home team here, uh, Tracy Benson, who is in our EDLD um, cohort for um, 2016. He's a member of what we call cohort four in the EDLD program. He's also a member of a three-person EDLD team uh, who has been in the process of constructing and will soon be releasing a teaching case surrounding the incidents in Ferguson. The case analyzes the organizational response of the Ferguson Florissant School District to the civil unrest following the shooting of Michael Brown. This case will explore the capacity of leaders, organizations, and communities to respond to radical, racialized incidents. Prior to enrolling at HGSE, he was a high school principal of the Pittsfield High School in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. So you can see we've got a very distinguished panel joining us, and I thank you all for being with us. 
we're going to, just a word on format, we're going to open the panel by, I'm going to direct a sort of a broad question to each of our panelists. Um, and then we're going to have some conversation uh, among panel members for a while. Uh, and then finally, we're going to open it up to you for your questions uh, to members of the panel. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to retake my seat up front here and begin with Dr. Anderson. Um, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your, the time and effort at a busy time, I'm sure, in the life of your school system to come and join us. Um, I, went, I want to begin by asking you to take a few minutes to describe how you understand the recent events that have so deeply affected your community, how you chose to lead the school system through these events, uh, and what you have learned. From an educational strategy standpoint, how were you handling difficult issues of race, inequality, and violence before recent events, during the crisis, and how are you planning to go forward? And, and finally, what will educators be doing differently in your district going forward? Uh, well, first of all, good evening, and thank you for having me here, and I appreciate uh, your time as well. Um, every good educator loves to brag about their school, so outside, when you first came in on the table, there's a packet of some articles or a little, um, a little thing that my secretary put together, and I saw some were missing, so I, I replenished that. So on your way out, if you didn't grab it, please uh -huh. do so. Uh, with that, um, the question is fair, fairly large, and so I'll just take apart some of that because I know we'll probably be coming around to a lot of these topics again. Um, Jennings uh, School District, we are 91% uh, poverty, 98% African American. We're probably one of the highest poverty, highest minority districts. Uh, not only in St. Louis, but in most places. We border Ferguson. We are the district where the command center was set up. And so, you know, when you saw in the news the uh, various individuals talking, they were talking from the target located in Jennings. So that kind of gives you some perspective. Um, I believe that social justice is something that you talk about all the time. It's the very first thing that I do in any district that I'm at. From when I started as an assistant superintendent, we start with a training called Dismantling Racism. It's for adults, and we have a similar training for young people. When you do that from the very beginning, you begin to build trust. Kids don't work hard for you if they don't trust you, neither will adults. And so without building trust, it's hard to move any district. It's hard to have any conversation. Um, little did I know that even prior to coming to uh, the area for Ferguson, when I was superintendent in Virginia, we had the Virginia Tech shootings, and, and that in and of itself was a social justice piece as well. And so, but in Virginia, much like in Jennings, um, that starting off point of talking about social justice and equity and making it a safe place to have those conversations. And so for us, the response is very different. So when you do grab those articles, you're going to see articles that um, speak to our experience, which was very different from the districts that were bordering us. Um, conversations were happening in classrooms, whereas districts around us were banning conversations. Um, for us, we believe that the very next day after um, the uprise in Ferguson and the unrest, our professional development was cleaning the streets of Ferguson. Um, so, so again, our experience and our reaction was very different and later throughout this um, panel, I'm sure we'll come back to some of the specifics about what we're doing. So prior to Ferguson, during and after, um, we have conversations about equity, race, um, social justice, and we're not afraid to have those conversations. The more that I can understand you, the better that I can teach you and learn from you. Um, that's part of what our belief system is. Um, and so. I think that gets to at least some of the heart of your question. Um, I'll stop okay. there in the interest okay. of time and for we'll other come, folks we'll and, and then be open to questions <clears throat> a little bit later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nicole, um, we want to get a parent perspective from you, and uh, sure. although you're a teacher as well, but um, could you describe the experience for us through a parent lens? What you experienced, what worked well for you in the midst of this, what didn't work so well, and what are you working on as a parent activist as you go forward to the future? Well, I'm here to represent a sh snapshot of parents in North County, Missouri, which includes Ferguson and the surrounding municipal, par municipal areas like Hazlett School District, where my son attends uh, school as a fourth grader and, and where I work. Uh, for example, we created a group called Parents for Peace, and the purpose of this group was to collect the love and support that was pouring in for the kids that were affected by the unrest since um, Mike Brown was killed. Um, the catalyst really to form this group was the closing of my school district. Even though it is close to Dr. Anderson's, my school district had a very, very different response. 
um, the impact of the unrest immediately affected the kids in the entire area. The negativity all over the media and on the streets was overwhelming for both parents and kids, and we <coughs> needed to find a positive way to love and support each other. Our goal was to organize the outpouring of positive love and support of Ferguson and define what Ferguson meant to us, rede redefine what was seen in the media. So therefore, a group of parents got together. It started out as just being a group of 10 families. It was co-founded with uh, Melissa Fitzgerald, who was of Ferguson, Florissant School District, and where my son went to uh, preschool with her son. So we became friends and we started talking on social media and the conversation was basically why are our schools closed and what can we do about it? And we began with one simple idea was that we wanted these kids to feel welcome when they came back to school. Now, was it my district? No, but my son was affected also. He was seeing the redefinition of what a young black boy meant on the television screen. And he felt like, and his friends felt like they needed to do something to be able to make these kids feel welcome because what they were seeing in themselves was not what was being reflected on the screen. So our simple idea was to just have a welcome back to school sign for each and every kid in the school district. We wanted them to know that they were safe. We wanted them to know that they were loved. So our mission was to have everyone in the group show up at a school on the day that it was supposed to start and just holding a simple sign that said, you are safe, you are loved. So we had kids all across the community sidewalk, sidewalk with chalks and say, you know, you are safe, you are loved, welcome back to school. Um, unfortunately, the schools uh, didn't open as planned that week. So what we did was we actually coordinated our efforts um, through our media website and we partnered with local libraries and churches and community, organiz community organizations to funnel in that information because as you know, the school districts were closed. You know, the teachers were required to report to work, but they were reporting to work in empty school buildings. Mm -hmm. Our kids were left at home, either watching the news or left at home with or without care, depending on if their parents could stay at home with them. A lot of our kids were, you know, the majority are free and reduced lunch. Parents were relying on, you know, the breakfast and lunch to be provided by the school and there was no resource for them. This, the school was that place that they were looking forward to to get that stability. So we, we need, knew that we needed to find a place to have that stability. Um, the School of Peace is basically where a lot of the, the, the parents gathered. The School of Peace was just basically an art teacher from Ferguson Florissant School District, Carrie Pace, who just went to the Ferguson Library and held up a sign and said, we're, we're here for your kids, drop off your kids here, because parents really had no place to go. Mm -hmm. um, they had no place to drop their kids for the day. So what we did was we gathered educational materials, we gathered food donations, we gathered volunteer time, basically, which was the most important human resources, that, that people resources. We needed a place to gather. Um, so that's what the goal of Parents for Peace was. Um, and, and as you saw through, out the news, you know, most of the news media crews were at the Ferguson police station. So what we did is we started sending information out through media at the news police station. My, my, my son helped me and just gave him information and saying that, you know, kids could go to school at the Ferguson library even though schools were closed. Um, and so that's, that's what kind of caught on and then we partnered with churches as the library filled up. We partnered with community organizations. Um, we, as, as we were putting up, you know, school signs in each and every uh, school, um, unfortunately, the night before the schools were supposed to open, um, my son and I were putting up a, 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 a sign in the yard <coughs> of uh, Griffith School, which was right down the street from where one of the major protests were taking place. We just didn't know it at the time. So as we're putting in the last um, school sign, um, just about a half mile away from where a major protest was taking place, the tear gas started going off. So here I am with my 10 year old son, you know, a few hours before curfew, uh, and curfew that was set in Ferguson, and we're putting up a sign that says, you are loved, you are safe, and here I am trying to, you know, make sure that we are, you know, safely escaping our own community, Ferguson, where he plays with kids and where he has friends there. So. I'm explaining to him, you know, we're out here trying to do, trying to show love and support in the community. And then I have to explain, you know, why the helicopter zo zooming? Why what you heard was not firecrackers? 
was not firecrackers, which I had actually assumed that they were, but they were actually tear gas and smoke bombs. The unfortunate part about that is that when he went to school the next day, there was no place to talk about it. There was no place to talk about race. There was no place to talk about the good things that we were trying to do and that there was no place to talk about the social injustice of it. While we as parents are forced to talk about that with our kids a lot earlier than mm -hmm. we are prepared for or that we have been prepared for. My son is 10 years old. I did not plan on talking to him about what happens when a police officer might pull you over until he was of driving age. Mm -hmm. Now I have to talk to him about why a toy gun is not going to be brought to the parks because I don't want you to be to the next Tamir Rice. I, I have to talk to him about what happens if you're playing outside amongst a diverse group of friends and something happens or you're playing outside and the police says, the police, if a police officer says you're jaywalking, how to respond to that? I have to now talk to him about you know, why he might be the first one in a group of kids to be blamed for something simply based on race. So those are the conversations and the things that we talk about on our Parents for Peace website. We also offer you know, a, a place of love and support and try to figure out how to work with schools and try to get them to realize that their biggest asset for us in a school district like us is the human people resource of the parents. I think that you know when they look at uh, when they look at parents and they look at you know the PTA, they should know. And I think I speak for a lot of parents that I can give a lot more love and support and effort than I can you know donating out of my wallet. And I think a lot of schools I wish would would recognize that the biggest resource that they have is the parents in that community group. Okay, you've, you've just given us an amazing array of activities, <laughs> and we're going to loop back to some of those. Uh, but I want to, uh, Valeria, Dr. Silva, you've uh, led the Minneapolis Public Schools and you've got a national reputation. St. Paul. St. Paul, I'm sorry. <laughs> Saint, uh, you've got a national reputation for the work you've done on the kind of topics that we're talking about tonight. And I, I wonder when Nicole says something like, you know, there was no place to talk about this, it seems to me like your efforts in St. Paul have been focused on creating spaces and opportunities and safety for talking about these kinds of issues. So I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about what you've done, what strategies you've used, and what results you've had. Um, in 2010, we started, I, I started as superintendent in 2009. I have a very similar background mm -hmm. uh, as you. Uh, being in a district uh, of 40,000 students, I've been there for 28 years, came from Chile, speaking no English, and I became a Minnesotan from one day, <laughs> and you, you betcha you got to know that. <laughs> from one day, I was a white person, and the next week, I came into Minnesota and I became a person of color as an adult. So it took me years to recognize that that was a reality, and I, ha I learned, like all of us, operating in the wild world. I call it wild world because it's the white world. And for years and years, very ashamed of my accent and what could I do to get rid of this accent and I speak like many of you, real English as I call it. <laughs> so when I became a superintendent, not only was a tremendous opportunity, but it also, it was a district that has created me as a leader. I never ever thought coming from Chile, I would become a superintendent and have the opportunity to affect the life of 40,000 kids. So we started looking at the data, our test results. I am not fanatic about tests. I don't think it's the only way to measure, but it's a way to measure. So we started looking at our test results. And every way we looked at it, it came down to it didn't matter what the income was. It did matter what the race of the student was. So I am in a district with 75% our kids are of color and 25% approximately, or 23% are white, and we have a 2% of Native American. And, and the reality is, for all of us educators, that it was 85% of our staff is white. It was a very difficult, very difficult thing to swallow. I've been part of the system. I have created those disparities. How do we take those disparities and we start focusing on what are we doing that we need to do differently because we cannot continue graduating another generation and another generation of kids of color that are not prepared. So looking at the 
information we had, we embark ourselves in what we call courageous conversations. It's a, it's a program that comes with a Pacific Education in Glen Singleton, and it really is not about that program. What it gave us, in this case, it was a framework, a framework to have those courageous conversations, a vocabulary which I would take home and memorize all these words that I was afraid to say. Whiteness. Are you racist? Am I racist myself? Yes. What part of me can change? How many different perspectives do we have from our world? So we started in the administration team, including my board of education, which is quite unique, embrace this job, this work, and we started to understand our reality and how our kids who come with 128 different languages that come from all parts of the United States because we have a lot of immigrants and from other places. And we have a community that has been settling in St. Paul for a long time. We have, and that's, it touched exactly what you said, we have to live together, but this is not about living together is really understanding each other mm -hmm. and learning from the gifts and fantastic things your community has that I could embrace and learn. So the work began to start figuring out as a system how we have those conversations. How do we work with our principals, who majority of them were principals who have been in the system for a long time, and many of them have never left Minnesota, and many of them are, were white, to make them feel that it was okay to admit that intentionally or unintentionally, we have an issue called racism in education, and race matters in education. So with that in mind, we've been working towards making sure that we all understand that this is not about shame and blame. This is about embracing how to talk about the reality of the United States today. And it's a reality that after being here for 30 years as an immigrant, that was the reason why I came here. I came here because it didn't matter what color your skin, what language you spoke, how poor you were, if you went and got education, you can, you can reach the stars. So, it has been a very difficult pathway because many of the way you take in order to do this kind of work, it requires you to be very open-minded. It requires to recognize that there are things you're doing that they need to change. So I, I cannot tell you that everybody in my district loves me, and, but what I can tell you is that we are moving the work not only for our district alone, we're also doing it with the city and the county. So in the last two years, the city staff as well as the county staff is going through the same training with the same framework that when our families and our students are served by the county and the <coughs> city, we're talking the same language. St. Paul is a city that is, has um, the lowest income for African American people almost across the country. And that's something that we all need to recognize. And it starts where? It starts in our schools. So with that, I would tell you that um, I'm excited about the work. It's not done. And I am blessed to be here because I'm hearing pieces that I didn't hear from the DV. That is your parent perspective. Call your son going through that. And I cannot even imagine what it would be for me personally and local and immediate, having had to go through that. So I, I really uh, have to applaud your strength and your leadership because you are still working towards something that this country is not even close to start dealing with. Thank you, Valeria, for starting us off in that way. I appreciate it. And there are a number of things that you've said that I want to come back to. Uh, Tracy, you've been a principal and worked on these issues from the standpoint of being a principal, and I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about your experience as a principal, what sorts of strategies that um, you engaged in or would like to have engaged in when you were in that role, um, and how you worked on this, 
excuse me, allergy season. <clears throat> and um, so that's the first part of my question. I have a second part of the question that has to do with institutions like the one that we're in, where we're in the business of training educators. And you're a student here and you see the processes that we engage in to build um, and, 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 and assist educators in growing into their potential for the future. And I wonder what you think the role of an institution like this is. But that's, let's take that as a second question. The first one is your own direct experience. Well, thank as an you. Agent. Thank you so much, Dr. Olin and Dean Ryan, for putting this panel together and rescheduling it. And thank you for allowing me to share the stage with such illustrious panelists. You know, I feel very, very blessed and, and fortunate to be able to have this opportunity to speak to, the, to, the, to my fellow uh, uh, students. Um, well, one thing I did as, as a principal is I helped the, um, the administrative ranks. Uh, go up 100% in their African-American sort of recruitment because I was the first African-American principal <laughs> of Pittsburgh High School. So <laughs> right off the bat, you know, I got that done. Um, so that's, good. that's a good place to start. So after that, um, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, let's just go, uh, go back a little bit to tell you about a little, uh, little bit of the context of how I became an educator. Prior to going into education, I uh, lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Any Milwaukeeans in the house? Okay. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin is the number one most segregated city in the United States. You know, most people think it's someplace in the south, that it's, you know, the deep south. No, it's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up in the black part of town because we all know where that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so as early as third grade when our local community school became too dangerous for myself and my five brothers and sisters to attend, we were then bused out uh, to the uh, suburban schools in a program called the 220 program. And we were sent out to diversify the suburban schools. And being of the first cohort of African Americans sent out to Brown Deer, um, let's say they didn't roll out the red carpet for us. You know, we were tolerated. We were brought in. Uh, myself being a student that was not very outspoken um, and was relatively good academically, I was just invisible uh, in the school. Um, not like some of my colleagues. I mean, some of my fellow. Um, uh, students from my neighborhood who were suspended more often than I was and were looked upon as troublemakers, I just kept quiet and so I was able just to slide by. Um, and I experienced a lot of overt racism and also the um, more covert, inadvertent, you know, invisibility. You know, he's just a student here being told my senior year of high school after I've already, already applied to college, I might want to think about um, getting a job or going to community college first. Um, even though I had a decent GPA and had been accepted to college already. And so that was my backdrop. And so I was steeped in understanding the vestiges of institutional racism and also, you know, the very overt racism. And so flash forward to my time in education, and I've been, had the opportunity to work in elementary schools in pretty affluent areas, elementary schools in less affluent areas, middle schools, and also high schools. So I have the K-12 gamut. And so uh, in my last two uh, positions, uh, I was the African-American in the building. Of, in a staff that was 100% white. Probably, a, a, you know, for lots of them, the first African-American boss they'd ever had, much less a 6'3", 240-pound African-American dreadlocks that, that they <laughs> had as, as a boss. And so they were scared of me, and, and likely it, it, it is what it is. They were afraid, you know. I was intimidated. My likeness is intimidated, and I've come to understand that um, because we're all steeped in the same media, sort of, uh, we're exposed to the same things, and blackness is especially black maleness, is seen as dangerous and threatening. And so that's something we have to accept, not just on my end, but also on, on all of our ends. So I was having a conversation with one of my cohort mates in, um, two weeks ago, and we were talking about the implicit bias test. Um, has anyone taken this implicit mm -hmm. bias test? Mm -hmm. Okay, who came up as racist? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but I was talking to him, and he had gotten, you know, he taken the implicit bias test, and he came out as racist, and he was upset by this, you know. And then he was also wanting to let me know that, you know, I read an article on the implicit bias test, and you know, African Americans take it, and they also come out as racist also. And it's so surprising to him. It wasn't surprising to me. We're all steeped in the same, we, we, this is the water we swim in in America. That when I walk down the street, and I'm a, a rather a large guy, and I see a group of African American <laughs> males walking towards me, don't think that the thought does not go through my head, like, oh, maybe I should cross the street. Mm -hmm. But then, you know what? There are people who look like me. There are people who look like people in my family. And so I walk by. But for a lot of us, that's something that we just do. And so d don't think that people of color are immune. Mm -hmm. We are somehow have these superpowers not to be steeped in the same sort of racist society that we've all been steeped in, okay? 
Um, but I'm going to give you an example of one particular practice at the high school level. I think that will illuminate sort of what leads to the situation such as the, uh, you know, Tamir Rice or, you know, the litany of names that we have. And this is um, something that, that um, it's an everyday practice, it's something that we call microaggressions. This is everyday acts of indiscretion, whether it's purposefully or it's, it's, un, it's subconsciously. And so um, in our school, we had about 15% African American population, 65% white. We had, uh, you know, 10%, uh, okay, I'm not good with percentages, uh, less percentages <laughs> of Asians and, and, and even fewer um, Lat Latino Americans. And so uh, we had about 1,000 students at the high school, and I love all my teachers. They know this. They have no problem with me sharing this because this was a purposeful practice. And so um, students would congregate in the hallway between classes, as high school students do, mm -hmm. all right? And teachers, you know, we'd ask them, you know, when the, you know, minute is, there's a minute away from the bell, we'd like you to clear the hallway and let the students know you got to get along to class. And what would happen very often is that teachers would be in the hallway, students would be congregating, and they would sort of gravitate towards who looked like they were causing the most trouble, the black kids. Okay, they stand out among the sea of whiteness in the school. So teachers would often gravitate towards the black group to clear them out of the hallway first and then proceed to clear all the white kids. Uh, and if you think about this practice, we have eight transitions a day. And this is going on every day. These students are being told every day that they are exhibiting the same behaviors as these white students, but because of their likeness, they have to be corrected first. Mm -hmm. And this is just a small vestige of that. And let me, let, let me uh, kind of dig into sort of the, 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 the outcome, so the, the dangers of ignoring a practice like this. And there are many more practices I can talk about, but just this one. And so what if we allow this practice to continue? So we're allowing these black students to experience these indiscretions every day. You know, their self-esteem is affected because uh, why are you picking on me? We're exhibiting the same behavior as all these white kids. You know, so their self-esteem is affected. They're getting more upset, and they're more likely to become more combative because oh, they're saying to the teachers, oh, why are you clearing me first? And even to, the, to, to so much to the extent that I'm getting referrals out of my office saying that, you know, a student has called me racist, you know? And in my head, you know, teachers are uh, upset. They're in my office. Students student call me racist. <coughs> I want them suspended. And, of course, in my head, my first question is, like, are you racist? You know, I mean, <laughs> could be, you know? And, and you know what? It's okay. If you're racist, it's okay. I said it. Only if you acknowledge that, and you know what? Is this something that you work on? We're all a little bit racist, okay? We have to accept that. Some people are a lot racist. But if you're gonna go work in communities of color, you need to acknowledge that and work on that. You can't say, I'm not a racist. And when someone does call you racist, you know, if you happen to be called racist by a, a kid of color, you probably wanna ask, why do you think that? Let's have a conversation. That's how you start to build the trust mm -hmm. among your students. Let's have a conversation about the racism at Pittsfield High School. And so what, what else, and, you know, if you're letting this, this sort of practice continue, what are, are you teaching all the bystanders? What are you teaching these white kids who are standing in the hallway? about black kids, mm -hmm. you know? You teach them that they are likely up to no good. And they see this every day, eight periods a day, this constant cycle of black kids being targeted. And then we wonder why when they leave school and they go on to become mayors and, and police <laughs> officers and teachers, that the cycle is perpetuated because they've been exposed to it through our schools. And so what I asked the teachers to do, and I had to do it also, I was guilty at times of doing this. Mm -hmm. So every time I left my office between classes, I had to remind myself, you must correct the behavior, not the student. Mm -hmm. And what they started to notice over time, which was miraculous to them, and, and, and to me also, because I didn't think they were going to keep to it, is that once you start clearing the behavior, the kids become more, more, more agreeable. You know, they see that you're correcting the behavior and not the students. So by the time you're clearing the third and fourth group of white kids, by the time you get to the kids of color, they're like, oh, they're clearing white kids. We better get out of here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. They mean this. Uh -huh. And then the teachers also started the question, like, is this really a fair practice? Because the white kids are getting upset. Like, what? You're clearing us. No, no, no. This has never happened before. So you have to really think about, is this really a bad thing? Or is it a bad thing just for black kids to congregate? So that's just one small, every, not small, but it's considered to be quite large practice that happens in our schools every day. And we wonder about the achievement gap. Why aren't, we, why aren't we provided enough, you know, enough rigorous instruction in the classroom? Why aren't we provided enough after school time? Why aren't we just extending today, the day? We're not attending <laughs> to all of the microaggressions and the, the subconscious racism that happens in our schools. How are we ever going to build the self-esteem of our students to realize that they are worth, worth something? I'll start with that. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can see why we've invited this particular panel to be with us. There's so much here, and we've got a short amount of time. 
Okay, I want, I want to uh, start, I want to come back to that question um, about schools of education eventually and give, give you all a chance to comment on that. But before we do that, I, I want to ask you about this notion of student voice. How do you give students more voice in this? How do you create those spaces in schools where students can talk about these issues, where adults can talk about these issues and feel safe and like they make progress on them? So I, I will start, but I, I also wanted to be very transparent. Um, last few days, I've been in the news a lot because I am one of the finalists for Palm Beach. And after I got to be the finalist and I realized the work we were doing in St. Paul, and what was I going to leave behind? I withdrew. And it's been a talk on the city after 29 years of being there because why did I do that? Why did I even apply? I looked at what you said. The effect on so many students, I have the opportunity to be able to influence 200,000 students, and majority of those students, 50% were Latinos. So I just wanted to get it clear in case you are in the social media and you see this superintendent telling you about how much she loves St. Paul. The reason why I withdraw is because my soul, my heart could not take this work and stop it today because it's not done. So with that in mind, we have started something that is called Dare to Be Real, which is the work that we have done specifically with the students. We are starting with high school, moving all the way to middle school and high school. And this is about having those courageous conversation, create that protocol for the students to talk about their issues related to race. This is not about a place to complain, but this is a place to figure out how as a group, as a community of students in X high school, they can change the predictability of what's going to happen in the hallway or what is happening when the teachers are, you know, looking at the students differently just because they're standing in the hallway. To me has been this last year that we've been doing this work after all the work we've done before. It's a continuation. It has been extremely powerful because the students are the voice that we are not hearing. Educators are not hearing our students. And the idea is that we can empower our students with no violence, with the ability to express what they really want to express and find solutions and help us, educators, including myself, how to become less racist and become more open-minded, understand what are the practices that we do every single day that we do not even know, but it's affecting the self-esteem and the future of those students. I tell you, I have participated probably in a, in a handful of activities with the students, and I have learned more in those conversations with the students not only because it was concrete, it wasn't about you told me this teacher, it was about a system change. Mm -hmm. And we have to, in this country, provide opportunity to all of us, the educators who were educated 30 years ago, that's me, or the brand new ones that the, you are around here, that the way we did business, it does not sit well with this society and this 21st century. Uh, Maybe if I could. <coughs> Building on that to Dr. Anderson, well, and, and, and Tracy too, uh, this, the professional development implications of what we're talking about. So you, you've just, Valeria talked about, you know, people have to re-examine their own practice and re-examine mm -hmm. their own attitudes. Tracy, you talked about they have to look into their own hearts and ask themselves what, who they are and what their values and approach is. But how do you, as a system, work with the abundance of teachers you have and persuade them that this is worthwhile work to do and to embrace the risks associated with this work. Well, if I may, I think there are two pieces. One, and I'll go back to that student voice piece um, and, and really piggybacking on um, much of what has been said. Um, you know, oppression is real and systematic oppression is real and you kind of talked about that and you've shared that as well. And so, you know, programs come and go. We come and go with the leader, they come and go with the superintendent, they come and go with the principal. So I'm not a big program person, not only that, we can't afford programs, so we really try to build in processes. And so because if I walk out the door tomorrow, the process has to be alive and well and continue. With that in mind, you know, we, we 
have approached everything from a systematic um, a manner. For example, and I'll just try to be real concrete for you all, um, just to kind of throw some of these things out. And uh, in fact, our students um, today is what Monday, Tuesday. It's today's Monday. Monday. So, Monday. so. On Saturday, our students spent, uh, a few handfuls of our high school students spent the day at Washington University where they've been studying over the last, they started it last uh, Saturday, um, and they will be there the next several weeks um, really building a system. It's uh, systems thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really building a system around a particular problem. The problem is really about, um, uh, you know, the culture in their school, uh, equity and justice, and, and they are developing how to solve uh, some of the problems that we're talking about here, not adults solving it. They're tearing it apart and looking at what are they gonna change, uh, but what's a system that they can put in place empowered by a university mm -hmm. partner. Um, and so that's one piece of that. Um, for us, and, and we talk about understanding, I believe you have to be on the ground and in the school and in the classrooms. Uh, often superintendents, the farther you get away from the classroom and teaching, the more layers you have, the less likely you're gonna be in the classroom. I wear tennis shoes because my entire day, morning, up until about 5.30 is in the classroom and I literally do not see my office until after 5.30. And so emails are done from the phone, and, and much of my time is that way because that's where you learn. Mm -hmm. That's where you, kids will talk different to you in the classroom and in the hallway than they will uh, in a formal kind of setting. Um, and so when you start talking about student voice, the first piece is you have to be with the students. You have to be with them in informal settings. You have to create safe spaces for them to come and talk to you in informal settings. After the Mike Brown, and some of our students, um, you know, live in Ferguson, uh, his, uh, family members of Mike Brown live in Jennings. And so, you know, we walk through the protesters to get to the school and I have to stand out front and tell them, come on now, you're getting the kids all riled up at the beginning of the day. Go, go on somewhere, you know, to the end of the day. And so they have to come through all that and get into the school. And so they would say, Dr. Anderson, everybody's walking out. There was one period when literally everybody, certainly in St. Louis, walked out of their schools um, uh, and out of, out of the high schools. And they said, Dr. Anderson, they're calling us punks, you know, because we didn't walk out of school. And, uh, you know, we, we need to walk out. You know, we, you know, we are the home of kind of Mike Brown, and we need to walk out. I said, where are we going to go when we walk out? And, uh, and so they said, I don't know, we gotta walk out, they're calling it. And so I said, well, uh, the first thing is that, you know, they did the sit in, and so I sat down with them on the floor, you know, no justice, no peace. If you want, if you want uh, things to change, you know, say you want things to change, we want them to change, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. And so we're all, uh, you know, riled up. I said, okay, I want you to write down three things you wanna change in your community. Three things, everybody bring it back tomorrow, that's your homework assignment, that's gonna be the morning assignment. <laughs> three things and come back. All right, now one more time, no Justin, no be okay, now everybody go to class. So they get up, <laughs> they all go to class. <coughs> and then at the end of the day, you know, we had a little, little session on uh, Dred Scott and just a few pieces of literature that, that would be good just to throw at them for them to read and, and to think about and talk about, you know, Jim Crow and, and just, you know, how, you know, policing now and the new, is, is like the new Jim Crow in many ways in terms of stripping your rights. And so kind of sharing a little bit of that. Next day they come back, they all had three things. We boiled it down to literally just three things out of the many different lists that came mm -hmm. in. And so those three things, that was amazing. I said, okay, we're gonna go up to the police station. We're gonna march. So you know, you're talking about student voice. This is student voice in real time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, okay, we're gonna, we, the, here, here's your voice. Here's the three things you want for Jennings. And so we're gonna march up to the um, police station. But you know, I don't believe in marching out of school because you need an education in order to get any kind of power to make any kind of change. And you have to know what change you wanna make. So you have to be in school. So anybody that tells you to walk out of school, something's wrong with them. And they're really kind of trying to perpetuate this cycle of oppression. Mm -hmm. We gotta be in school. So I will get a bus. We're gonna meet at 6 a.m. We're gonna take the bus halfway so we can get back to school by eight o'clock. <laughs> it's Doc Manson. You go, and I said, I'm gonna march with you. And if we're, and we're, and we're, we're gonna dress where we're going, not for where we are. So you be sure you wear your suits and then and other kinds of things you need to wear so they take you seriously. And decide who's gonna speak and all that. And I'm gonna march with you. And then you're gonna get fired. I said, well, this better be a good march. Y'all better show up. <laughs> Come on now, y'all better show up now. Uh -huh. Six o'clock, you know, 50 students, 60, 70, 80, somewhere around 100 and some students. We take the bus halfway, we have all our, our signs. And we march, we, they drop us off, you know, a few blocks from the police station, we march the rest, rest of the way. All three demands met, and the demands, uh, so that you kind of hear what those are, body cameras, um, it was community policing, um, as well as um, more minorities on the police force, because we have very few on the police force in Ferguson and in Jennings. That's a pretty good list for young people. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is student voice. That's student voice. 
And so without taking up too much time, because I know you want to touch on many things, when you talk about staff development and teachers, for us, staff development, and again, I'm just going to give you some real things that we do instead of talking in generalities, because it, practicality may help you depending on the position that you're in in your district. For us, uh, staff development, first day teachers start before the very first day they walk in their classroom, they do a home visit. We get one big bus, they get on the bus, we give them the roster for their students, we take, we highlight the students that have the most problems in the classroom or who've been suspended the most or, or who are the highest poverty. And we stop at some of those homes to give those parents a backpack. Imagine if you get a backpack and they say, hi, I'm, uh, this is, you know, Tiffany Anderson, she's going to be your child's teacher. And, and we pair them up with someone as well. First of all, they get a chance to see a whole other world of living. <laughs> and then we come back and we talk about what did you see? And, and imagine if for five years in life you grew up in a home that had very little light, all white walls, uh, blinds pulled down. Imagine what your mentality is going to be. So if you welcome that child in that classroom and you have a classroom full of colors and noise and all kind of stuff, you might overstimulate those children. They'd be bouncing off the walls and you'll be calling them ADHD in no time. That is not how you enter into a classroom. So that is staff development. We don't have a whole lot of money to, to hire a whole lot of people, and I don't think we need it. I think we're each other's best resource. Mm -hmm. um, and so for staff development for us, you know, we do just, t we have 16, well, 12 to 16 teachers that teach the other teachers. We do a lot of on the ground kind of work, and then we send teachers to places that are the best and brightest in the country to learn from. Um, so many islands of excellence, and I think what we do in Jennings can be replicated, what she's doing can be replicated, but you don't know what you don't know. I yeah. can't wait to come and visit you. Mm -hmm. Please. Mm -hmm. well, that's a, Not that's, in the winter. Okay. That's, that's a, you have a real winter there. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's certainly our hope in having you here. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicole, you're both a, an educator and a parent. Yes. So, I mean, how do you, you know, working with your colleagues in schools, how do you see the professional development challenge and what works? Well, I know that ever since um, Ferguson that, uh, you know, parents have been asking, how do we start talking about these things that are affecting our kids in the classroom? And while the teachers and the principals have the luxury of saying, okay, we will talk about it at an appropriate time, you know, in history, you know, when the subject of slavery comes up, then maybe we'll be able to tie that in. Well, unfortunately, as parents, we don't have that luxury. Things are happening on a daily basis that we have to talk to our kids about. Um, for instance, in the Hazelwood School District, cultural competency training is a goal of the district to be able to eliminate the achievement gap and um, do that within by 2015, 2016. Now, like you said, that's a program, and that sounds great on the website, but how do you actually implement that on a daily basis if you are unable to talk about race in the classroom? If a kid wants to talk about their experience in Ferguson, they are sent to their counselor because that is treated as a counseling issue. It's treated as something that you need to talk about in private and hiding. And that is not something that we want to teach our kids. We want to teach our kids to be able to talk about, you know, what's fair, what's, what's, what's tolerance, what, what's justice. How do we genuinely communicate that bridge, you know, between home and with teachers? You know, how, how are we able to do that? Um, I think that if we don't embrace the new wealth of diversity in our growing North County school districts and all over the country, then kids miss out on this huge learning opportunity. This is a chance for us to role model those things as parents. We have to be able to talk about it as parents with each other before we can expect our kids to be able to have genuine conversations in the classroom. Anna. Tracy, could you talk? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the, uh, and we're talking a little bit about professional development here, but what about pre-service? What about the kind of work that goes on in the School of Education? Um, what, what ought we to be doing uh, to prepare our graduates to be more able to engage with these topics in meaningful ways for students? Thank you for that question, Dr. Ruff. I knew you'd like that. So <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm just going to, you know, speak like, I mean, those who know me know that, it, you know, I've become more unfiltered as of late. And um, <laughs> so when we talk about this issue of social justice or achievement gap or opportunity gap or motivation gap, I think we need to erase those names and just call it what it is, racism. Okay? We need to be comfortable with talking about this and comfortable with ag acknowledging it and making programming around it. And we can't make programming around addressing racism in schools if you can't even say the word. Mm -hmm. right? And if, if you get kind of hot and red in the face in, in mixed company you know, because you're, you're, you know, you're recognizing your racism, and, and it's okay. Um, and I don't know how to get there because I haven't had the opportunity to have the programming here. Um, being steeped in this work for well over, you know, well, all my life, I, I can't shed this, 
but uh, in terms of being in education and, and, and working on you know, anti-racist or addressing racism in the classroom or at the school level, I've been steeped in the work and I, my intent on coming to a school of education, and this was at Carolina where I went for my master's and also here at, at, the, at the Ed School, my, my need is to be able to have conversations with white people, you know, about how do we talk about racism in a way that's non-confrontational. Because it's not just a one-way street. You know, the promise of fulfilling diversity, I assume that there's more people, more, more of a diverse student body, you know, we apparently bring something to the institution. And we have, you know, we can talk with other people who are different than us and also with white people about what racism is, what it looks like. Um, and, but it doesn't stop there. You know, it needs to be a reciprocal conversation in terms of, all right, um, and I'll give you an example of, of this because this is so normative. I'm um, the only black person a lot of white people know, okay? And they are free to ask me questions, but you know, I'm thinking about doing this. Is this racist? You know, what do you think about that? And if you've done it, you know, it's fine. It happens. It's become so normative to ask black people black questions, right? Or ask Asian people Asian questions, you know? And so when I made the, the ask of like, you know, in front of a group of people that, you know, I want to ask white people questions about how to talk to racist white people. You know, it was a, <gasps> Don't put us in a box, you know. I'm sure you know a lot more white people than I know, okay? <laughs> and a lot more racist white people than I know. So if you're gonna ask me questions about black people, I should be able to ask you questions about white people so I can understand that better. So when I go into schools and I see that there's an achievement gap and students are suffering and they're being, you know, being treated differently and we want to address the racist, subconscious racism that we're all steeped in, I don't do it in a way that's confrontational. And that's how Schools of Ed get, gets us to the point where we need to be, that we can actually have that conversation with each other. And also that it just doesn't exist in spaces that have <laughs> minorities, because there's a lot of schools that have only white people. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, there's, there's, this, there's, it's been said to me a number of times that, you know, I went to school with all white people, so we just never had to talk about race. Mm -hmm. White's a race, y'all. <laughs> okay. And when whites leave your schools, you don't stay in, well, you do live in a white world, but you don't only interact with pe other people who are white. Okay, and so there needs to be this conversation happening in all facets of the different spaces of education, nationally, because it's a national issue and it affects us all. No one likes to see a U.S. citizen gunned down in the middle of the street. No one likes to see that. Am, am I correct? Yes. Regardless of the color. So if that's an issue that's specifically affecting one sector of our population, we need to have the question. We need to have the conversation about. Why is it, and how do we remedy that? Because everyone who works in the professional jobs goes through our schools. And we affect so many people and so many lives in our time in which we work there that our ability to have these conversations will help affect the future generations and maybe these issues won't happen anymore. But what I, what I want to get at a little bit, maybe some of the other panelists can help as well, is how do you create the safety that makes people who might be reluctant to participate in this conversation for fear that they'll do the wrong thing or you know, fulfill a prophecy that they're guilty of racism or one thing or another, um, tend to avoid these conversations. You said we should have these conversations. How do we as leaders within educational organizations that we're part of make it safe to not only have conversations but make mistakes in those conversations? My experience has been that as educators, and we are kind of like technical solution people, okay? You want your checklist, you want your schedule, you want beginning and end, and talking about race, it's not like that. You will not change how you teach if your belief system doesn't change. And in order to change your belief system and expectations, you need to be open to be vulnerable. And in order to be vulnerable, you need to be able to see that the conversations we are having in our schools, because we have teams or racial equity teams, or the conversation we have in the larger training, it's not about the shame and the blame. It's about, I am giving you tools to talk about what history has developed and created in the wonderful United States. But it's a tremendous fear. I do have many of my staff, they feel that this training, whatever the, this training has been shame and blame, and if we would have had a different uh, program or a different person doing the training, we would have done it better. We cannot continue 
as educators in 2015 continue thinking that we're gonna get a book that tells you how mm -hmm. to become a better teacher of black kids. It's about who you are. So and the belief system is what I feel is, has been the hardest part for me as a superintendent because I am a different leader today and it's very difficult to be so not open <coughs> <clears throat> to see that the world ahead of us has been so narrowed, and you said so many things about what's happening with our, the white expectations in society, that instead of just fighting it, because it's not intentionally, let's make sure that we don't continue with that. So again, it's not about the PD and how many technical checklist and what do I do with the kids stand up. It's about creating that relationship, knowing mm -hmm. that when I'm talking to you, I truly need to know why you are thinking that way when I see it in such a different world because I have never experienced to come into mm -hmm. the house where all the white world, uh, mm -hmm. walls were there and there was a family of 11 living in a one or two bedroom apartment, not by choice, but by poverty. So that is how we can continue blaming the, the community, blaming the health system, blaming the job market, the housing, it's all. But we only have the kids for six and a half hours a day. Let's give them hope, but real hope and no law, low expectations. One last question before I open it up <coughs> to our audience. So you might be thinking in the audience if you have questions and have questions for particular panel members. Uh, but last question, the Dean uh, talked about the, the challenge of diversity uh, that we're embracing as a school of education here. In many school systems, this is a challenge, attracting people of color into the teaching professions, into the education leadership mm -hmm. professions. <clears throat> what advice do you have for policymakers or folks in schools like these to, uh, as to how we can do a better job with that? My perspective is a little different on that. Uh, and I guess, uh, and, and, and to go back to the piece of uh, the staff development and how to create safe sp uh, spaces, um, I, I think there has to be a commitment and there has to be intentionality behind it. If you walk into a school or a classroom and you're not um, making that commitment, then it's not going to happen. But I think if you put that on the forefront, then everything you do will be around building relationships in ways that create safe spaces to have conversations. And they happen every day. I mean, it can be a child suspended. It could be privileges around us right here in this room in so many ways. So there are opportunities for instructional dialogue every day, all the time, about privilege and why things happen. You just have to be intentional about it. Um, and that will help with who you select to be in front of students, who you select um, to train folks, um, and, and the kind of conversations that you have. So that being put aside, in terms of recruitment, I don't think that it is um, as difficult as people would want you to think that it is to recruit minorities. I don't, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, it, and take a look at Ferguson right now, and they hired all, had all these African American people come out for the police force uh, that they say they could not find any police officers for. And so, so why suddenly are they coming? Is it because the word's out? Is it because of all the stuff with Ferguson? For myself, um, I was the first uh, African American, first female superintendent in Montgomery County, Virginia, and, and it's 400 square miles. It's larger than the city of Kansas City, the area itself. And some areas I would go to when they literally had not really had much interaction with an African American person. And I'd put out my hand and they'd, shrug and I'd say, well, okay, I'm gonna hug you. Okay, put my hand out. <laughs> <laughs> Create a different kind of way to get to know me. So I can't walk around with a chip on my shoulder, but I have to walk around with the understanding that you have to understand me and I you because we are interconnected and if you don't do well, I won't do well. You know, it's that whole idea. And so when you talk about recruitment, um, where are you recruiting and how are you recruiting and how creatively are you recruiting? You know, are you recruiting in the same places that have no black people? <laughs> well, you're probably not gonna get <laughs> black people, you know, uh, or people of color, um, you know, and so, you know, we're talking about we want great science and math teachers and we say, oh my gosh, there's a shortage. Well, then hopefully you're getting out uh, in advance and in, in going to the best science and math universities that are producing the best science and math candidates. And, and so I, I think really, um, if you, if you want to recruit diverse populations of people, then um, you have to change your belief system and your approach. 
And by doing that, uh, you will find that you can recruit the best and brightest, and I don't care where you are. Um, and, and Jennings, when I came there, and again, remember, we're almost all African American, almost all high poverty, and I said, nobody wants to come to Jennings. We can't get good teachers. You know, it was a almost unaccredited district. Everybody's here poor. I believe we can break generational poverty. I, I believe that. And so 30% of our staff is now uh, individuals that live in Jennings or mm. either they are alumni. It's amazing. 30% of our staff. Mm. That didn't happen by accident. That was intentional. Mm. Saying, how are we going to recycle the dollar right here in the community? How are we going to recycle the black dollar, the Jennings dollar, the dollar right here? Um, how powerful that piece is. But, that, but that's an intentional piece. So yes. recruitment can be creative uh, depending on the space and place that you're at. Sometimes it's not even the recruitment. In St. Paul, I have more administrators of color. We went from 17% to 39% in four years. And I have more administrators of color coming from all around Minnesota and the surrounding districts to apply for jobs, not only administrators of color, also teachers of color. Why? Because they know the work we're doing in St. Paul. They want to be part of it. And I don't place mm -hmm. A one black male, sorry that you had that experience in a school that there's no other black males. You create a cohort. <coughs> we have affinity groups for these people who are working the hardest job because people believe because you're Latina, your Latino kids are going to behave better. No. <laughs> if I'm a Latina, my African American students will steal and my white students and anything. It's about the relationships. And then you have to create an environment in where people want to fight the fight together. And this is not fighting the fight, it's fighting for the future of this country. So I tell you that we're going to have to make budget cuts and we have the rule for last in first out, and I'm very, very uh, struggling with that because I'm going to lose many teachers of color because that's what we have done in the last few years. We have attracted many teachers of color. And I, I think recruitment is, is definitely an important piece, but I think even so, we have to, uh, you know, as parents and teachers, look at the teachers that we do have. You know, in the Hazelwood School District, we are, um, you know, in, in my son's school, it is predominantly you know, white female teachers. And I think that we have to not only trust that relationship with the teachers and the kids, but we have to remove the fear. That teacher has to be able to have the abil abil ability to confidently talk about race in the classroom and not fear their jobs. You know, I have to be able to trust my son's relationship with his current teacher now. You know, as a parent, we're dealing with what's happening now. We have to change, you know, the mindset of, of the teacher who might say, you know, I don't see color, I don't have a problem, I'm not racist. Well, my problem is, is that you may not see the diversity and appreciate the diversity and the resource that you have right then and there. So I think it's be beyond recruiting more great African American or more great Latino teachers, I think it's also changing the mindset of just a great educator. You need to appreciate the diversity that's in your classroom. You need to be able to teach kids that don't look like you. Just because you're an African American teacher doesn't mean that you're going to be the best teacher for that African American student. You have to be able to appreciate the greatness and the strengths of your students that you are teaching. Okay. Thank you all very much for that. We're going to be We're not finished yet. Now it's your turn. And we have only a short amount of time, but we've got 10 or 15 minutes. This is a topic on which everybody in this audience, I'm sure, has very strong views and complicated views. But in order to get ma as many people in as possible, we'd appreciate it if you'd make it a question rather than a speech and direct it if you um, are directing it to a particular panelist, direct it to the panel. Please. My name is Jamarcus, and I thank everyone on the panel for coming. Uh, I thought it was really refreshing, uh, Dr. Anderson, when you talked about the trainings that you have, the dismantling of racism training for students and parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question kind of goes to when you're in communities where there are very few voices of those that are marginalized, how do you think that we cultivate these conversations? And I mean this in the general scope associated with social justice. So I mean, if you're a male football coach, how do you start talking about sexism to your NFL team? Or if you're a white principal in a predominantly white community, how do you begin to, to discuss racism? 
Well, you know, and, and, and I've been in each one of those communities where sometimes the minority uh, really is a minority and then now it's the minority and Jennings is the majority. But so well, when you look at talking about social justice on any topic, any of the isms, homophobia, sexism, racism, any of that, again, intentionality doesn't change. One, you have to be intentional about how to start it. Two, you have to build that safe space. And in order to do that, you have to build a relationship. And so if I'm that coach, then I'm going to make sure that I have a creative way to build that kind of relationship, not only with my students, but with my parents. So they understand here are some pieces that we're going to talk about and here are some ways we're going to approach that. No matter who you are, if you don't trust me, it doesn't matter what I bring to the table, you're probably not going to eat it, right? And so I need to make sure that we build that relationship. And if you do that, the conversations that you can have will be so different than what you would have outside of that. So I think it starts with that. I believe every school, classroom, and district moves by three things. And literally, in any district I've been at, even as a teacher, that are underperforming three things, relationships, pedagogy, curriculum. You do those three things, you can move any school, classroom, <laughs> turn any one of them around, but if you don't have relationships, the other two will never work. Mm -hmm. So how do you build that climate for social justice in that conversation? Starting with relationships, because that's where the beliefs sit, right. and then creatively doing it beyond that. And, and you know, after this, we can talk about particulars about what that would look like. I think we should. But that's kind of a general way of answering that. All right, thanks for that. Okay, thanks, we'll go over here. Hi there, sorry, so short. Um, I am from the public health field and I've come to learn that health and education are inextricable forces. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing um, in our communities is kind of like a war zone type of situation. Nicole, you mentioned tear gas and there's viol um, you know, active shooting, things like that. What are some, perhaps not programs because we might not have money for them, but processes that can be implemented into schools and communities that are actively addressing um, kids who are experiencing P PTSD type of um, symptoms and you know mental health issues like that. It, does anyone have a concrete example of something that's been implemented? Or what would you like to see from me as a public health practitioner work with you guys on, on building? And if Thank I can you. kick that off and turn that on over to whoever else wants to pick up from that, since you're right there on the ground. Um, for, for Jennings, we have a mental health therapist in every school. You know, it's so crazy in schools, you know, everybody has to have the, you know, the eye exam and the ear exam. And why in the world do, do, doesn't every school have a mental health therapist? It's crazy. And so, how can you afford it? Um, well, I have one assistant superintendent and a few directors. That's it. That's my entire central office. Um, so when I started, I had the pleasure of our maybe not pleasure is probably the best word, but when I came in, many people were uh, retiring and they had, were retiring before I started. So instead of filling those positions, I figured I would take a look and see, do I really need them? Is there a way to utilize teachers to do some of this stuff to spread the wealth a little bit? Um, wrote a few grants, but primarily we are very, very streamlined. Um, and so with that in mind, and a lot of those funds are diverted back into the classroom. Um, some of it's also partners, and so, you know, one of the partners, and, and you'd be surprised what partners are there that will partner but just have never been asked because it sounds so crazy to ask the question. We feed 8,000, we give 8,000 pounds of food a month. We have the only Missouri St. Louis food bank. We literally took a school, turned it into a food bank. 400 people a month line up all the way down the street. If you kind of want to see a video of it, there's an Ed Week Leaders video uh, that shows that, and I had not even seen it on tape because I'm normally there serving the food. 8,000 pounds, how do we get that? It's free to us, primarily. Some of it's our budget, but some of it's the St. Louis Food Bank. Every city has a food bank that serves the uh, you know, soup kitchens. Who thought a school could get that? Um, we now have Washington University. They have a clinic called the Spot Clinic downtown in St. Louis. They said, wow, it'd be neat if we had a clinic or a hospital with a pediatrician. They said, we'll, we'll write a grant for that. They wrote a grant. Guess what? We have actually a hospital <laughs> that opened up in January inside of our high school. I mean, it, it is phenomenal what you can do when you say, let me dream as if money is no barrier because it is not a barrier. Our mindsets and closed mindsets are the only barriers that you face. And then going out and seeing what partners are there. So that's ways that you can partner to explore creativity in ways that haven't been explored in the past. And you would be surprised what you come out with. Okay, let's go over here. Um, my question is for Dr. Anderson. Hi. Um, my, um, I'm interested in immediate response to trauma, how you have experienced it in the past and how um, your immediate response in um, Jennings unfolded and advice you have for other systems leaders for responding to trauma. 
now remember, I'm in Jennings now, but you know, prior to this, Virginia Tech, there's nothing that'll prepare you for having 20 or, or so folks that um, are killed overnight and all of your volunteers in one of your schools. And so trauma in a, is a real piece in terms of what I've um, been exposed to in my time as superintendent. And with that in mind, and that's where the mental health piece is, is essential um, in terms of making sure there's a commitment to having that at every school or at least a mental health partner at every school. The other piece is just making sure those resources are there all the time. When schools are closed, um, Hopefully, now most schools don't do this, but this is what we do. Hopefully schools still stay open for food uh, and for mental health counseling. And so we still stayed open for those things. In fact, we're open on Saturday. In Jennings, we have Saturday school. Mm -hmm. uh, why do I have Saturday school? It gives me an opportunity to offer free lunch, free breakfast, and mental health if students need it. And at the same time, they can come to school. Okay, and so you know, so when we talk about supporting kids with trauma, knowing that that's a real issue, making sure the people resources are there, um, but also making sure the professional development for staff. You know, often trauma displays in such a way where kids are labeled as problematic or disciplinary problems or whatever the case may be. Um, and teachers often can't dream of some of the nightmares that my kids kind of go through overnight and in the morning what they walk through the door with, I'm amazed they make it to school, much less sit in the classroom. And so educating your teachers about trauma and what it looks like, uh, practical stuff, not general stuff, literally practical <laughs> situations that happen in your own community. And if you do that and empower teachers with knowing what to, to see, then, then they can get those kids to the right resources, but you have to have the resources there, okay? If you don't have the resources there, it's a whole lot of talk without action. Okay, we've got time for, did you want to say something? Well, there? I was just going to say that our, our Senator Maria Nadell Chappelle actually requested, you know, when the National Guard came into the streets of Ferguson, that they send as many mental health counselors mm -hmm. to the streets as they send National Guard. Of course, that request wasn't met, but that's what was needed on the streets of Ferguson. Mm -hmm. But when you transition mm -hmm. into the classroom, that's where our kids are supposed to be educated. I mean, they're educated first at home, but they should be able to be educated so they grow up, so they don't have the same biases, so they do have the conversations about social justices and tolerance and all those things that should be taught as a education in the classroom. This is where we should be teaching our kids. You know, they shouldn't be sent to a counselor. Uh, you know, for, hopefully there is a counselor in school for those who are experiencing trauma, but they should not be sent to a counselor to talk about how they want to be an advocate for their community. Mm -hmm. To me, that's not a mental health issue. That is education in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Hi, um, I teach anthropology at the high school level, which is a really exciting thing to get to live my undergrad. And I know that anthropology has sort of a, a bad history in, in some aspects, but I'll tell you there are some amazing resources um, that when I teach a huge unit on race in the classroom and you, maybe you put out a whole bunch of different paint chips and you say, okay, where's the dividing line between black and white, go. And the kids are trying to figure out, and they start to, to have hands-on ways to think about race that is not initially as perhaps upsetting or you know frightful or whatever, um, to get them to really engage. And then we talk about concordance and non-concordance and standing up by foot size or skin color or hair texture or all kinds of things to really get them to just be open and sort of open their minds. Also. Um, I don't know if you've used race, power of an illusion that PBS has, and the kids absolutely love doing it. And once you really get them to realize that it is the safe place that they can talk about race and that if anybody says anything that hurts anybody's feelings to just say, you know, that hurts my feelings and how can we work through that. And just to, I don't know, you plunge in, you just jump in and um, I don't know if you've looked at the anthropology website or looked at race, power of an illusion, but um, if you haven't used those as ways for adults and for kids to, to break down the barriers and just jump in, um, I've always had a great response and the okay. kids really get into it and there's a whole pile of things. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Professor Revel, since that was not a question, I'm may joking. I <laughs> have a question? <laughs> you noticed. Go ahead, Ola. Thank you. Uh, so this question is for Tracy. Tracy, you alluded to the fact, well, the feeling that you um, and perhaps your other uh, colleagues at the School of Education were not getting the type of preparation that you had expected coming into this program. Could you talk a bit about some uh, ideas you have about what the School of Education could do to better prepare educators to go out into the field and address and work on these issues? 
Thank you. Um, and we, we said earlier, we talked about student voice in you know, K-12. We, need, we have student voice right here at Harvard. And we have a diverse set of students here at Harvard who have a diverse set of experiences and diverse set of competencies. Um, we need to develop a set of competencies that reflect what is needed in the field. You know, if we are expected to go out and be education innovators and talking about uh, participating in um, the ed sector in terms of innovation and possibly opening up schools or working in press communities, these are communities of color. And if this is something that's reality for a lot of our graduates, it, it was a lot of our past. If you went through Teach for America, as I did back in 2001, that was very much a part of my teaching experience. Um, and if this is something that's, that we're going into, we need to be not assume that we come with these competencies here. I feel that uh, right now there's an assumption that we come with these companies in order to be able to lead in diverse environments. We need not to assume that, but to provide us with a forum, being a, a, making it core to what's expected of us as educators when we come in, that we are expected to at least take one course about leading in diverse communities. That because sure. I think one of the questions that someone asked, and what does it take to lead for racial equity? It takes you to be a very courageous, mm -hmm. sometimes kind of stupid leader, <laughs> because it's never going to, f and right now, and I hope it changes, that we are not the only ones who are trying to lead for racial equity. It's going to create a lot of people feeling very uncomfortable. So and I hope the College of Education creates the opportunity for future leaders, if they're principals or superintendents, to learn how to be courageous without being controversial. And I think that is the difficult part, that as soon, because of the systems, as soon as you are not following what everybody does, you may lose your job or you may get a bad reputation. For me, has always been, I really don't care. It's about mm -hmm. the kids. Thank you. Well, we've reached the end of our allotted time. We've only made a beginning on a rich set of complicated issues. I want to ask you all to join me in um, applauding this extraordinary panel. Thank you so much. for joining us. Good luck as you go forward in this work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. What are the reviews here? Oh, thank you. Oh, she's coming to collect. Advanced leadership. Advanced leadership. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I do know. Hello? Hello?